What I'm trying to do here today is to discuss with you some of the strategy we used uh, recently in our attempt to develop a vaccine uh, for heterologous protection against PERS. Now, as you all know, PERS is still a major threat to the global swine industries. There remain many problems contributing to uh, the difficulties in our control of this uh, deadly disease. Uh, we know uh, each year in the United States alone, uh, the disease costs more than $660 million. Uh, many problems, uh, uh, such as the emergence of a new and more virulent strain of PERS, uh, the persistent infection of the virus, uh, genetic variation or heterogeneities, and of course, uh, co-infection with other swine pathogens. This all contribute to our uh, 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 difficulty in control of these uh, important pathogens. So one of the best examples about the emergence of a new and more virulent strain of PERS is probably the highly pathogenic PERS uh, uh, that was emerged uh, years ago from China. And this so-called pig high fever disease is caused by the highly pathogenic PERS and variant strain of PERS and has devastated uh, uh, the swine industry in China and its neighboring countries and caused immense uh, economic losses and, and very high mortalities. And I'm looking forward actually today to lesson about the new variant strain, the, the RFLP174 later today. I saw that in the program. Uh, so looking forward to that also. Uh, immune modulation, uh, of course, is uh, a major problem. Uh, the virus is very smart and encodes uh, genes and, uh, and that can modulate the host immune systems. And uh, the virus encodes the product that can antagonize interferon and also encodes product that can suppress the class 1 MHG expressions. So consequently, you have a weak cell mediated immune response. Uh, you also have a, a delayed and not a robust neutralizing antibody response, and that makes it difficult to clear the virus infection, therefore uh, often lead to persistent infections. So that certainly is a problem uh, we are facing today. And of course, the co-infection, uh, the number of bacteria and number of viruses have been shown to potentially aid PERS infection and PERS-associated disease. I'm not going to go into details, but at least here are some of the bacteria that have been uh, studied. Some of them show uh, clearly there's a potentiating effect, such as mycoplasm high pneumonia, uh, strep suce, and they all show has been uh, shown to enhance uh, the PERS-induced disease. Uh, a number of viruses has also been shown to potentiate pers associated disease. Uh, one of the viruses is the post-sign circle virus type 2. Uh, this virus has been shown to enhance the PERS replication and also PERS associated disease. And, and in fact, and if you look at the PCV2 cases today, a significant proportion of PCV2 cases uh, you found today actually associated with a PERS infection. Uh, so the co-infection is really the major problem right now uh, that prevented us from control this uh, a deadly disease. And of course, uh, the genetic variation. I've uh, been talking about this uh, for many years, yeah, and uh, the heterogeneity is a major, major problem uh, in vaccine development and control of this uh, uh, disease. Uh, if you look at the type 2 PERS, and the type 2 PERS alone, and this is the uh, a bit of a study from uh, uh, Fred Leon's group years ago, and there are at least nine genetic lineage. And uh, just within the type 2 PERS, uh, and this is the work, I think I use this slide too, probably too often, and Mike probably going to charge me uh, if I use it again, but uh, uh, there are at least three uh, 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 distinct lineage in the type 1 uh, PERS. So you can imagine that in a vaccine based on a single strain of PERS, is unlikely going to be protect against this genetically diversified field strain of PERS. So, so what are the current studies? We do have a vaccine now. We do have a, 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 quite a few vaccines, both modified live vaccine and also killed vaccine. 
Uh, the majority of those vaccines, as you know, are based on a single strain, and they are effective. Uh, the vaccine, special modified live vaccine, are effective uh, against homologous strain, a genetic similar strain. However, when it comes to heterologous strain, the vaccine sometimes produce a mixed result, uh, and the results can be very variable, sometimes not very effective for the heterology protections. Uh, as for killed vaccines, uh, there are products available, and, and again, the result for the killed vaccine has been mixed. Uh, in most cases, they are not very effective at all. Uh, so certainly we need uh, the next generation vaccine that can provide uh, broader protections. So what are some of the potential solutions we could use in overcoming some of the problems I just talked about? It. Uh, I talked about the genetic variation. I talked about the, the heterogeneity and the emergence of a new, more varied, varied strain of PERS. Uh, some of the strategy has been used recently, including uh, 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 the use of a killed vaccine, a uh, multiple uh, uh, cocktail of multiple va vaccine. Again, the result has been mixed for those type of approach. Uh, but there's a lot of study recently done using synthetic purse based vaccine, either through uh, the DNA shuffling process to produce chimeric virus that can uh, confer broader protection, or through uh, the synthetic biology approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, uh, just a few minutes. Uh, another problem I mentioned is the immune modulation uh, by the virus, and, and so there are ways to overcome this potential problem. One of the strategies is to target the viral antigen directly to the dendritic cells. Uh, so uh, we recently have conducted a study trying to uh, deliver specifically and directly the viral immunogen to the dendritic cells. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that result. And of course, uh, we can try to develop vaccine that can suppress the regular T cells. Uh, we can also try to develop modified live vaccine uh, that can uh, that contain modified glycosylation pattern, and, and, and therefore the vaccine can induce a stronger, uh, uh, a robust neutralizing antibody response and a cell immediate immune response. Uh, as for co-infection, uh, one way to overcome these problems, of course, develop a multi-component vaccine. So there are studies currently under, uh, undergoing uh, and uh, both a vector vaccine or uh, modified live vaccine that target simultaneously multiple pathogens. So, so there are some potential solutions. So today I'm going to focus on uh, the synthetic purus based vaccine. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine that target dendritic cell to enhance uh, the T cell immunities. So over the last two or three years, we've been using the technology called molecular breeding uh, through the DNA shuffling process uh, in an effort to develop chimeric viruses that can confer cross protections. Now the molecular breeding actually mimic the nature's recombination strategy, but at a very rapid rate in vitro. So, so basically we can rapidly produce uh, recombinant viruses or recombinant genes uh, in a very short period of time. We can then screen the recombinant gene or recombinant viruses for desired properties such as uh, uh, heterologous protections. And so this is really not something new. Actually, we have repeatedly over the years using the molecular breeding process to produce uh, livestock uh, for uh, uh, improved uh, uh, production uh, and for disease resistance. We have used the breeding to uh, create a crop for better yield. So it's not something new, uh, but this uh, has been now being used to breed viruses for uh, broadly protective properties. So there are two uh, approaches for this molecular breeding, the traditional DNA breeding and also the synthetic DNA breeding process. Uh, for the uh, traditional DNA breeding, basically, uh, you uh, took genes from different parental viruses. Uh, you can see here from these slides, uh, there are four genes shown in four different colors, and each of them coming from a different parental viruses. Of course, here are coming from four different parental viruses. Uh, we then mix these virus genes, and we then digest them with nucleus, with DNA1. Uh, so they become a very small fragment. 
we can then perform PCR without primer. So this small fragment can then self-anneal and amplify. And after which we can then use PCR with a specific primer that flank uh, the gene of interest to amplify uh, this shuffle of the genes. So the library of the shuffle of the gene can then be cloned into the backbone of the purse infectious clone. We can then uh, screen for infectious virus and screen for desired properties. So this is a, a typical traditional DNA shuffling approach. Uh, as for synthetic DNA shuffling approach, we take advantage of the known genetic variation from the large collection of PERS sequences that we already know. Uh, we can then incorporate those genetic variation into the chimeric gene through the de uh, degenerate PCR process. So we have been uh, shuffle uh, essentially all the structural gene of PERS individually over the years. And uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to show you two of the, uh, the experiments we did. Uh, one of the work is that we shuffle the GP3 gene from six uh, heterologous strands of PERS. And if you look at here on the left side, this is a follow genetic tree show uh, the six parental strains that we selected for the shuffling of GP3 gene. And you can see here, uh, they are genetically different, and they are from different genetic lineage. And in the top uh, right panel, this shows a uh, form of the representative shuffle of the GP3 uh, by the traditional DNA shuffling approach. You can see now that this shuffle of the GP3 uh, now contains a sequence from each of the parental viruses. And the bottom right here is showing uh, a representative a diagram of synthetic DNA shuffling of GP3s. In this case, uh, we utilize the, uh, a panel of degenerate primer, which we incorporate those mutations into those degenerate primer to create these chimeric genes. So to make the long story short, we were able to successfully shuffle the GP3, and we were able to successfully rescue infectious chimeric viruses. And uh, you can see here uh, the top panel showing four representative chimeric virus with the shuffle of the GP3. This is a traditionally uh, shuffled GP3. Uh, they are all infectious and replicated in Mark cell. And the bottom left panel show a, a, a chimeric virus with a synthetic shuffle of the GP3. You can see here is also uh, infectious replicate in the Mark cells. And, and most importantly, uh, we compare their replication characteristics with the backbone virus. In this case, we use the VR2385 as the backbone virus. And you can see here these eight chimeric viruses, the four traditionally shuffled chimeric virus and the four synthetically shuffled chimeric virus, they replicate at a similar level. Uh, so in other words, the GP3 shuffling did not impair the replication property of the resulting chimeric virus. Now this is very important because the ultimate goal is to create a virus uh, for modified live attendant vaccine. Therefore, the virus has to to be able to replicate the well in cell culture. And we show here that shuffling did not impair the growth property of the virus. So that is very encouraging. Uh, we then conducted an animal study. We uh, uh, characterized a, a number of chimeric viruses in pigs. Uh, we look at the infection dynamics, uh, uh, the immune response. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to talk about those results in details because of the time, but I'm just show you one slide here. Uh, this slide shows that one of the chimeric virus was shot for the GP3, we call it GP3 uh, TS22. Uh, you can see here this particular chimeric virus now induced cross neutralizing antibody uh, uh, against the heterologous strain FL12 and uh, compared to the backbone virus VR2385. And the cross neutralizing antibody did not appear actually until about 42 days post infections. So, so this is a GP3. I'm going to show you another example of an individual struct gene shuffling. In this case, I'm going to show you a little bit about the GP4 or M gene shuffling, also uh, from a six parental strain of PERS. So similarly, you can see here, uh, we choose six genetically different strain of PERS. Those show in both phase here on the follow genetic tree. 
for both the, uh, the GP4 on the top and the M genes on the bottom here. And so they are from different uh, genetic lineage. And again, we show some of the representative chimeric virus. The top shows the GP4. Uh, there are three representative chimeric virus, and the bottom show five representative chimeric virus from a GP6 and, or M. And again, you can see here that this chimeric virus now contain the sequences from each of six parental viruses. So once again, we uh, rescued successfully uh, those chimeric viruses. We uh, characterize them in vitro, their growth uh, characteristic. We'll also characterize them in pigs, uh, look at their infection dynamic and the immune response. Uh, and again, I'm going to just show you one slide. Uh, this slide shows that two of the chimeric viruses we tested. Uh, one was a shot for the GP4 called GP4TS14, uh, right here. And the other one called uh, MTS57, uh, MTS57. And these two chimeric virus, you can see now, induce significantly higher cross neutralizing antibodies against heterologous strain of PERS, MNY84B, FL12, and NADC20. So three different heterologous strain of PERS. And so that is very encouraging because we now demonstrate that when we shuffle individual single structure gene of PERS, we can create in the chimeric virus with improved cross neutralizing activity. So the question we ask at that time is can we combine this single structure gene shuffle of the virus into one mosaic virus? And this mosaic virus would contain all shuffle of the structure genes. So the question is number one, will this mosaic virus be infectious? And number two, if so, can it induce better cross-protection? So to answer that question, uh, Dr. Debin Tian in the lab uh, very recently uh, constructed uh, a, a number of mosaic viruses that contain all the shuffle of the structure genes. Uh, listed here are some of this uh, construct. I'm not going to get into the details because uh, Dr. Tian is going to make a presentation, I believe, uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if you're interested, uh, you can go uh, to his talk. Uh, but, but you can see here, he made a number of these uh, 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 mosaic viruses. And each of these mosaic viruses, you can see now, contain shuffled structure genes that are come from five or six different parental viruses. And uh, so I'm going to just show you one slide, and because uh, I don't want to uh, steal his thunder for tomorrow's talk, but show you one slide here. And uh, this slide shows that one of the chimeric virus, uh, he called VR2, uh, this particular chimeric virus, you can see now, in the, uh, when, when, when we vaccine the pig with this chimeric virus, uh, the vaccine the pig has significantly reduced a microscopic lesion in the lung, and gross pathology lesion in the lung compared to uh, the arm vaccine control. So clearly we show that uh, the shuffled mosaic virus that contain all the shuffled structure gene now induce uh, cross protection against two strains. Uh, here we challenge with uh, ANDC20 and also with MAY84, two heterologous strain of PERS. So now, we show that we can create a mosaic virus with a shuffle of the structure gene that induce cross protection against heterologous strains. So the question we asked then was, can we use the shuffle of the viral antigen and develop an acute product, a killed vaccine or subunit vaccine? Because the problem with the subunit vaccine, kill vaccine, is they do not induce sufficient level of cell mediated immune response. So we were thinking that if we can maybe target this shuffle of viral antigen, which we knew they induce cross neutralizing antibody, if we can target this shuffle of viral antigen directly to dendritic cells, we should be able to enhance or induce cell mediated immunity, and that will help us to induce the better cross protection. So what we did was that we were able to use a technology called dendritic cell targeting vaccination. Uh, we targeted this shuffle of the viral antigen directly to the dendritic cell through the DC sign molecules. Now, as you know, uh, DC sign is one of the C-type lactam receptor which expressed on the surface of dendritic cells. 
uh, they can capture the pathogen pathogen drive glycoprotein and then internalize them for uh, efficient antigen presentation. So when we target specifically the shuffle of the viral antigen through the C-type lactam receptor, such as the DCSI, and the immunogen now induce enhanced T cell and CD8 T cell immunities. So what we did first for this approach is we, of course, first have to clone and characterize the post sign DC sign molecule. So we uh, did that, and we were able to then uh, fuse the carbohydrate recognition domain and the neck domain of the DC sign molecule with the MOS IgG FC uh, fragment. Uh, you can see a very nice expression. When they immunize mice, we generate a panel of monoclonal antibody against the post sign DC sign. Uh, one of the monoclonal antibody is, is called DC428, and this antibody has a very high affinity to the post sign uh, DC sign molecules. And uh, you can see here this, uh, this antibody recognizes the carbohydrate recognition domain of the DC sign molecules, and also they specifically bind to the monocyte dried dendritic cells. And, and we also then show that when we mix the antibody with the dendritic cells, and the cells rapidly internalize these antibodies. You can see more than 50% antibody rapidly internalize. So this is a very encouraging. Uh, this work was done by uh, uh, Dr. Shakti Subramani in the labs. And uh, so, so Shakti next day decided to fuse the shelf of the wire energy that I talked about earlier and we know this shuffle of the viral antigen induced cross neutralizing antibody. He then fused to the carboxy terminal of the heavy chains of the uh, DC side antibody. Uh, I'm not going to get into details about the construction of this uh, uh, vaccine antigen. Uh, this paper just published. You can uh, 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 you know, look at it in details. But basically, Shakti showed that uh, the, this antigen now can be rapidly internalized by the dendritic cells. So when we mix this DC target shelf of the viral antigen with the dendritic cells, more than 60 to 70 percent of them rapidly internalized by the dendritic cells. So this is a very promising. So we decided to then conduct an animal study to look at the immunogenicity and also evaluate the T cell immune response of this uh, novel DC targeting vaccine candidate. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to show you all the results, but uh, I'm going to just show you a couple of slides. And what Shaxi did was he used three groups of pigs, and we used a very large number of pigs, 16 pigs for each group. Uh, one group was uh, DC targeted vaccination. Another group just shuffled the viral antigen without DC targeting. And, and the third group is the adjuvant control. So you can see here, this is the frequency of interferon gamma positive CD4 T cells. You can see here at the seven days post vaccination, we've seen a significantly higher interferon gamma positive T cells in the DC targeted vaccinated groups compared to the non-targeted group and to the adjuvant alone groups. Uh, we did give them a booster dose, and uh, what we found was that the booster dose actually did not enhance uh, the frequency of interferon gamma positive T cells at all. Uh, but we did say that at seven days, you can see there are significantly higher uh, interferon gamma positive T cells. Uh, similarly, we also look at uh, the interferon gamma positive CD4 positive and the CD8 positive T cells. Uh, same thing we see here. You can see here at the seven days post vaccination, the 14 day post vaccination, we see the significantly higher frequency of interferon gamma positive CD4 positive CD8 positive T cells. So this tells us that when we target this shuffle of the viral antigen directly to the lytic cell, we can enhance. T cell immunity. Now, this is a very important because, as I mentioned earlier, the subunit vaccine or the kill vaccine, they typically do not induce T cell immunity. So now we have a shuffle of the viral antigen that we know induce cross neutralizing antibody. Combined with this enhanced T cell immune response, we expect that this DC targeting vaccine will induce a better course protection compared to those non-targeted vaccines. Uh, we have scheduled a large challenge and efficacy study. Uh, I think so we're going to start in February, so unfortunately we don't have the challenge study right now. Uh, so hopefully uh, very soon I should be able to share the result with you about the challenge and efficacy studies. 
And the last piece of information I want to talk about is, is a recent paper, it's one beautiful paper, I would say it's a breakthrough paper recently published by uh, uh, Wu and Fernando Osorio from uh, the University of Nebraska. They used a synthetic biology approach uh, essentially synthesize in a consensus approach, and just amazing, uh, you can now use your synthetic biology to just to synthesize a virus. And, and the principal actually is very similar to the DNA shuffling approach I talked about earlier, uh, the synthetic DNA shuffling approach. But what they did was that they were able to generate a centralized consensus approach based on 59 uh, uh, different full-length sequence of approach, type 2 approach. Uh, they were able to successfully generate uh, an infectious purse they called purse count. This is consistent per and show actually uh, this virus produce uh, induce a very good heterologous protections. And uh, I'm going to show you one figure from uh, from their publications and uh, right here. And the infected the pig with this consensus purse and then challenged them with a heterologous strain they call. Uh, 16244B, and, and they show that this consensus purse induce, uh, 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 can significantly reduce the viral load in the blood and also the viral load in a number of lymphoid tissues. And that's a very promising. Uh, I know there's still a long way to go before you can uh, 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 transition this into the product, but that's very promising. Uh, 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 indicating that the synthetic biology approach, uh, this DNA shuffling approach, can generate a potential vaccine candidate uh, for better protection. And uh, so I'm going to conclude here. And uh, so what I have shown you here today is that we have used recently uh, molecular breeding approach and through DNA shuffling that we successfully generated chimeric virus uh, that contain that possess the cross-neutralizing activity against heterologous strains. So this has the potential to further develop in the future potential uh, uh, vaccine that confer heterologous protections. And I also show you that when we target the PERS, the shelf of the PERS antigen that we know induce cross-neutralizing antibody directly to the dendritic cell through the DC cell molecule, we were able to enhance the T cell immunity. So now we have and the candidate vaccine that we know induce cross neutralizing antibody, and also we know that induce T cell immunity. Uh, so hopefully this will translate into better cross protection in our uh, plan challenges study in the future. So I'm going to uh, stop here to acknowledge those in the lab who actually did the work, and, and particularly uh, Dr. Debbie Tian. Uh, Dr. Shekseva Subrevene, uh, Dr. Lei Zhou, and, and Dr. Yan Yan Ni. Uh, they are the one uh, primarily did the work I talk about here today. I have a, a pretty big uh, first research team in the lab. And uh, I have to thank my collaborator, uh, Dr. G. Carver, uh, sitting right down there. And so it is. Uh, uh, G has been a, a, a strong supporter of this project. And thank you for all those uh, stimulating discussion over the years. And uh, uh, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Tanya Presnick, who is now at the University of Edinburgh, and she uh, uh, has been a great collaborator over the years. And of course, many others. I'm not going to name uh, them, each one of them, but they know who they are. They've been very, very generous providing me challenge virus dog, uh, the antibodies, all kind of key materials. So I thank all of them for their support.